So let's get to it, shall we? Let's talk about behaviorism in the history of psychology. Now, the one thing that makes behaviorism very different from psychoanalysis is that unlike the qualitative theories uh, on the European side of psychology, behaviorists were interested in trying to create psychology as a science of observable behavior. Many behaviorists wanted to see psychology as a true science in much the way that ecology is considered a true science. And so the idea was we were going to focus on just observable behaviors, no feelings, no thoughts, nothing that were abstract or internal, only measurable responses. And so it's the idea that many of these methodologies relied on controlled experiments where there was very rigid conditions and very rigid responses that were measured. It may be interesting to note that the very first behaviorist was not in Western Europe or North America, but was actually a man by the name of Ivan Pavlov, who was in uh, Moscow, Russia at the time. Much like Freud, Ivan Pavlov was a trained medical researcher, and he was interested in actually studying uh, digestive systems, and he was actually studying the salivary consistency of drool in dogs. Sometimes saliva was kind of sticky and thick, and sometimes saliva was runny and watery. And he wanted to understand what would predict these different types of saliva. So he had dogs in his, in his study, and they were tied up in a harness and had an apparatus in their mouth designed to catch and measure their saliva. And he would present them with different things, uh, dry bone versus meat or, or what have you. And doing these experiments, he had an accident. He made a mistake in his research. He discovered that the dogs would drool when there was no food present. And he thought, why are the dogs drooling when there's no meat present? He quickly realized that the dogs were drooling not in response to meat alone, but they started to predict what led to the meat. That is, the dog started to drool at the sound of footsteps of the research assistant bringing the meat. They also started to drool to the sound of the laboratory door opening to the meat being presented. So Ivan Pavlov started a new type of experiment. That is, he started to intentionally pair the presentation of meat to the dogs with the ringing of a bell. If the, if the bell rang and the meat was presented enough times, eventually you could remove the meat, just ring the bell, and the dogs would drool to the sound of the bell alone. He identified this as pairing the stimuli would lead to classical conditioning. And this was responsible for identifying lots of different involuntary chain reactions in the body. The first American to pick this up was a man by the name of John B. Watson. And so he, instead of pairing a salivary response, Watson was interested in understanding the development of phobias and conditioning phobias. In a very controversial experiment that John B. Watson is associated with, there, it's called the Little Albert Experiment, a young infant was given exposure to a small white furry rodent, a rat or a mouse, according to certain historical records. And infants are not born with phobias. They're not born with fear. And this small white rodents tend to be very calm, not aggressive. Everything was fine. The rodent was not going to hurt the infant. However, once the infant was playing calmly with the rodent, Watson would have a research assistant bang a hammer against a piece of steel, making a large bang. And that large bang would certainly startle the infant, causing crying and emotional alarm. Once the bang was paired enough times with the white rodent, once, once the infant calmed down and they just started playing with the rodent again, they would bang again. And while this is paired enough times, just the rodent alone, alone was enough to cause a highly anxious, fearful response in the young infant. Now, this experiment was very controversial because uh, the historical records are blurry on whatever happened to this infant. And also, there appears to be no uh, deconditioning or unconditioning of the phobia. And so this was considered to be very unethical. John B. Watson was eventually fired from his position at the university and moved in away from psychology into business, where he used conditioning to really shape marketing in business structures. That is, before his work, a lot of general stores and print advertisements relied on very lengthy, wordy advertisements. Whether you were purchasing a tonic or a soap, it was very common to see um, many different words in stylized font explaining the medical benefits of a tonic or soap product. 
uh, Watson decided to get away with all the wordiness and to just pair a product with imagery that would stimulate the mind and think of happy thoughts. So pairing a happy model with a bar of soap or a tonic was considered to be easier and people would instantly match it in their mind with something that was happy. We can still see this today in things like beer commercials. For instance, if a beer commercial is showing people that are partying and joking and dancing and having a good time, uh, that product is going to be associated with happiness and having a good time. You're more likely to buy a product that's paired with that scene rather than if we tried to sell beer through showing a person crying and sitting alone in the dark and drinking by themselves. If we also think about automobile commercials, it's very often the automobile commercial is showing a large vehicle driving free in an uncongested rural highway in the mountains and there's a deep voice. The narrator tends to have a deep masculine voice talking about the powerfulness of the truck um, or the car. In comparison, we often don't see uh, a stressful uh, working parent coming back and they have screaming kids in the back and they're caught up in rush hour traffic and, and there's you know turn signals or someone cut them off in traffic. We usually don't see that type of stuff in a car commercial. So how we pair a product with different emotional responses can make us think differently about brands. Now, moving away from Watson and Pavlov's type of classical conditioning, there's also another American by the name of B.F. Skinner, who was known for really pushing the idea of operant conditioning. So Skinner was known as a radical behaviorist. He believed there was no free will, much the same as Hemholtz, and he believed that everything we chose to do wasn't actually a choice. It was predetermined based on our previous experiences. He believed that everything we experience is a series of consequences. Everything we do, no matter how small or how large, has a response. And that response is either a response of punishment or a response of reinforcement or reward. And so he believed that if you were talking with someone and they're making eye contact and smiling at you, you'll talk more to them. Versus if you're talking to someone and they stop to check their watch or they play on their phone and they're not paying attention to you, that you are going to wrap up your rant or you're going to change your pace or you're going to drop the story altogether. And so he worked primarily with animals. He built these very fantastic operating operant conditioning chambers known as Skinner boxes. And he worked with rats and pigeons. And he could train them through a variety of levers and buttons on which things to do in these operant conditioning chambers. For example, if you press the green button and it released food pellets, animals will learn to press the green, food, green button more often. Versus if you press the red button and it released a small electric shock, animals would learn to avoid pressing the red button. He had trained animals to do a variety of fantastic and sophisticated things. At the height, he'd even trained pigeons to play a very modified version of ping pong. Now, if you were to go to a behaviorist for therapy, you might be shocked to find out that the therapy is very quick. That is a series of four to eight very quick sessions. Unlike psychoanalysts, uh, they just want to get in and out, shape your behavior. Remember, they're not interested in your thoughts or emotions. And so some of the examples of behavioral therapy include things like phobia treatment. If someone is phobic of, let's say, spiders, it's the idea that we would use exposure therapy, gradually exposing the person closer and closer to more and more spiders to reduce that conditioned fear response. So the idea maybe originally you start watching a movie about spiders, then you see a spider in a jar at the other end of a room, then you go closer to the jar, then the spider comes out of the jar and into the therapist's hand, and then the therapist actually makes you hold the spider at the end. This type of exposure therapy is known to be very effective, uh, and, and most phobias are very treatable through this type of therapy. In addition to getting people to get over phobia, we can also use behavior therapy to address things like addictions. And this is usually used through aversion therapy. An example of this would be if someone has a substance addiction. We compare the substance they're addicted to with another substance that will make them very nauseous. For example, if someone is, has uh, alcoholism and they are experiencing this addiction to alcohol, we compare their alcoholic beverages with a pill that will make them very nauseous, which will eventually give them a taste aversion, uh, food aversion to the taste of alcohol. 
Another type of therapy has its roots in behaviorism is of course applied behavioral analysis. This is very effective and very popular with children who are on the autism spectrum. And this is a more long-term and many more hours than just four to eight sessions. And this is where a behavior analyst works one-on-one -on -one with a child to reward them through doing simple tasks such as dressing or eating or sitting still. And they get a variety of different rewards or tokens uh, to learn how to do these adaptive skills. So now that we have discussed both psychoanalysis and behaviorism, it's important for us to think about how these two schools of psychology uh, stack up against each other. There is certainly a lot of overlap. For instance, psychoanalysis believes that we don't have control of our fate. It's really the fate of our unconscious. And uh, behaviorists believe that we don't have control in our fate. It's really in the control of whether we've been reinforced or punished or what we've been conditioned to do. So they both believe that there is no free will. They both believe there's something that happened in the past that influences us but there's still slightly different ways they would be used to explain the same thing. For example, if you were very mean or rude to a family member, let's say a younger sibling, if you were very rude or mean to a younger sibling, why? What would be the rationale that a psychoanalyst would give to explain that? And what would be the rationale that a behaviorist would give to explain that? Perhaps a psychoanalyst would say there was something in your unconscious, maybe you had an inferiority complex, maybe there was this unconscious desire to be spiteful towards your sibling because you noticed your parents gave them more attention. That could be the psychoanalyst explanation. The behaviors may some, say something like uh, you were rewarded in the past through being tough. Being tough to them uh, actually gained you something. Or maybe you were punished in the past for being nice. Or maybe they had disappointed you and you wanted to punish them. So although they might use slightly different words to explain it, there is some overlap. Some other examples could be uh, if you know a person who blew their entire month's budget on buying the fanciest, coolest electronic device, why would they do that? Now they have no money to pay rent and financially they put themselves in a hard point. How would a psychoanalyst explain their behavior and how would a behaviorist explain their behavior? Can you detect some differences? And the final one I want you to think about is why are you listening to this lecture or watching this lecture right now? What is the motivation behind that? What would a psychoanalyst say is your motivation? And what would a behaviorist say is your motivation? Again, you may detect some slight overlaps, uh, but the wording they may use to explain this would be a little bit different.